Last album tour, we had um, uh, the shows up and running and everything, and then the pandemic happened. So we only really did like about half of the tour we had planned. So um, so this time it's like we've had to get it all together again, and it's almost the same sequence. Of, yeah, the same sequence of shows: uh, Glasgow, Liverpool, London. Uh, so yeah, it's deja vu, but <laughs> yeah, it's gone well. So. Yeah, I mean, it's good to be back. Um... Um, it's everything's been a bit disjointed. It's been disjointed for everyone. But, um, yeah, we all would play our favourite places, so it's three places. Never put that Let's pull the best. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, okay. Um, I don't yeah. worry about that. I'm not sure about this, but. I mean, presumably, quite a few people here tonight were at the Coco yeah. show last night. That was good as well. I'm just saying Liverpool was better, that's all. Thanks for coming. <laughs> but um, I actually, I had a look at the set list. Sadly, I couldn't make the gig last night, but the, I, obviously there's a lot of the, the new album uh, in the set, which, which we'll come to. But um, I noticed <laughs> the encores, the last three songs, Play Girl, 17, Destroy Everything You Touch. Wow, that's not messing about, is it? <laughs> That's brutal. The band goes last. Yeah. Um, so about the new album, um, very sort of vague question, I suppose. But um, in your words, where does this sort of fit into the grand Lady Tron scheme of things? This one. I don't know. It's 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 kind of seeing like uh, how how people responded to it, and uh, I think people hear different things. Um, some people think it sounds like whatever album from our, our, our past that like some people compare it to. I've seen it compared to Light and Magic, I've seen it compared to Fellow Schiffer, I've seen it compared to Witch Now, I've seen it compared to Gravity the Seducer. And a lot of people, I don't know, there's kind of an impression that we've introduced this new element of um, influence of shoegaze or but that's been there for like 20 years, so it's, it's not new. Um, but I think, I don't know, I think this this album feels to me personally, it, it, it kind of stands on its own. It's not part of the chronology. It doesn't sound like a follow-up to the last record. Um, it's probably the most, I think, the most self-contained. Like if I was going to give someone one record to just, okay, what are we like? Okay, then you can... I'd, I'd give them this one, uh, so th so that's where it fits in. I think it it's kind of outside time, the take temporal. I think. I think the same as Danny. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a very yeah, short. I like the sound of my own voice. I can't <laughs> answer. No, I mean, um, yeah, it's hard. Like I, I, I've read, you're not meant to read what people are thinking, really, because it can make it can bring you down sometimes, but um, you can't help it. And because you want to know how your album has been received, so um, sometimes you do. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people have said it's like our own our own stuff, and I find that quite hard to understand, to fathom. Really, I don't know um, that it does. Um, so for me, that's yeah, a, a little bit odd because um, you know our earlier albums like Light Magic, I just feel like they're they're worlds away from what we're doing now. Um, you know, it's always like classic Lady Tron. We've always got that sound that I, I don't think anyone else has really. But um, and yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like we're, we're replicating or, yeah. or the early stuff <coughs> really is is in this. It's, it feels like newer to me. It feels new. It feels like fresh, but still. But, I mean, we're not repeating ourselves. It just, it just sounds like a Lady Tron record. I think that's what people mm -hmm. mean. Yeah. You know, a certain, a certain. The sonic palette and certain elements and the arrangement, and then Helen's voice starts, or Mira's voice starts, and it's like this later on record. Yeah. Which I, mean, I think is what we're aiming for, right? Yeah. 
I know you mean about the sonic palette, but I, I suppose what has changed over the years, I mean, this, this album is very atmospheric, very textured and very layered, I think. Whereas, you know, in the very early days, things were maybe, certainly the first album, things were a bit more lo-fi and the colours on the palette be more blocky. Um, but now it's, yeah, much more sort of impressionistic. The resolution was lower in those days. <laughs> yeah. 640 by 480. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I think it's, some of the people often maybe get wrong with, with your music. They, it's, it's that people think it's, it's cold and has, and it's sort of emotionless. But I think that's kind of misunderstanding how music works. Because, you know, all right, you're, you're not sort of um, singing your heart out and your throat raw and, you know, sort of delivering emotion in that cliché way. But it's music which creates emotion in the listener, I think. Yeah, for me, like, I'm, I'm really not keen on over singing. So a lot of, like, um, singers nowadays, nowadays, they're all about trying to reach that note and, like, bend it up there and down. And, and for me... That's never been. I mean, I probably couldn't do it, but <laughs> but it's not really what um, what I'm trying to create. So um, you know, maybe that's that's not good, but um, that's the vibe that I don't want to go for. Um, so, um, but yeah, the emotionless thing, I, I I've never really got on board with that because it, you know we all write, and when we're writing, it's coming from emotions, it's coming from experiences and things like that. And that all goes into, let's say, the lyrics that I write. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, that's quite, that's quite deep and it's quite hard sometimes to express certain things. And yeah, we often do it in a kind of um, vague way so that you guys can interpret it as you want to interpret it. Um, <clears throat> but I think there is a lot of emotion there. And so, yeah, it's a bit hurtful sometimes when when people say, "Oh, you're just a nice icy cool and yeah, ice you know. maiden." Yeah. Well, I'll take that actually. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember one of the first one of the first reviews we got when Playgirl Playgirl uh, came out. Uh, I think it was the Maldi Maker actually. So maybe when you were <laughs> still there. <laughs> oh, okay, after okay. Yeah. So um, uh, I think it was that band Reef yeah. reviewed the singles. <laughs> and they were actually, it's your singles. <laughs> <laughs> but they were pretty nice about it and everything. But then one of them said, I don't know, there's just something missing from it. It needs something emotional, like a loud guitar or something. <laughs> and, um, so so yeah, so this is what this is what we were up against at the yeah. beginning. It was associated with um emotionless music and it never was. Mm -hmm. Even even that first album, I mean it's uh, a lot of it's really Quite sad. Yeah, I don't think people knew what to make of you in the beginning. I'm going to come on to that actually. But um, I know it's the, the, the title track. There's maybe a bit of a sort of Delia Derbyshire, BBC Radiophonic Workshop, Doctor Who kind of feel going on with that. With Times time, time, Arrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's what yeah, Mirrors that Mirrors going for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. About Times Arrow, the title. Uh, it's one of these phrases that you sort of feel like it's 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 in the air. It's been around, and obviously there's the, the Martin Amis. <laughs> Novel, but I, I, I looked it up and there's so many other things. There's this Arthur C. Clarke um, short story about dinosaurs and uh, the, the Martin Amis is about a, a Holocaust doctor and there's this Stephen Jay Gould book about the geology and so on. And I think there's even an episode of Bojack Horseman and there's a, 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 yeah, and an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation and stuff like that. There's so many things called Time's Arrow. For, for you, what, you know, why, why did you pick that one? Well, it's Mira's song, so uh, yeah. what she uh, heard... Um, interpretation of it is just um, the impossibility of living in the moment now. You know, time's arrow of the theory um, that time can only progress in a, in a straight line, uh, but can only be experienced in retrospect. And uh, so that's her interpretation. I don't think she named it after the Martin Amos book or anything like that. This is an idea from astrophysics and so on yeah. as well. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's the limit of my understanding of astrophysics, <laughs> and please don't ask me to elaborate any further on Three that. Three questions in, and we're getting deep with the science here. <laughs> yeah. Mir is a scientist, we are. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, the time does seem to be quite a sort of theme on, on the album, the lyrics. So if I just sort of pick a few out here. Um, Memories, a hall of mirrors, echoing for years, bending time, that's Flight Manco. Um, and then there's... Faster now we know time waits for no one. That's from Dreamers, my favourite track actually. Um, and then Time's Arrow itself, T um, Time's Arrow, um, Born with a Bang, and there's stuff about cesium fountain replacing grains of sand and cesium clocks are the thing. And 
um, and atomic clouds set clocks that uh, track you down. So it's a recurring thing about, about time. So was it a case of these are the lyrics that came to you and then, then it's like, okay, we, we better call the album that? Or, or was it, did you work outwards from that, from the theme? It's together, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a strange one because, because we're dotted around the world and let's say Mir's in London, I'm in Scotland. Um, you know, we tend to we tend to write separately and then um, come together and record and whatnot or collaborate together at a slightly later date. Um, so with Times Arrow, um, the album, we um, we were writing individually because obviously we couldn't be in each other's company; we weren't allowed. Um, and so we didn't really know how it was going to come together as like a concept as an album. And so we're all writing individually, and then we realised we're kind of actually probably writing about similar yeah, things. Yeah, the themes it was strange. It coalesced strange. together with yeah. these these threads through it. And then when when Mira put in Times Arrow, we were like, this is the title title track. It yeah. was obvious, but it wasn't planned like that. It was just I don't know. We were all thinking about we were thinking about similar things and interpreting them in slightly different ways but maybe uh, we're just in sync because we have known each other for like forever yeah, yeah. <laughs> that might be an element of that <laughs> there's a lovely quote from brian eno about you saying that lady tron are for me the best of english pop music <laughs> <laughs> just thought, well you know yeah. two of you are not two of you are not english and but yeah i mean in, in terms of being a sort of <laughs> a, a global band to a dear you <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a we'll nice still take it, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, take it. <laughs> it's a lovely compliment to have. But in terms of, you know, the, the challenges of being dotted all over the world, um, for, for example, uh, the, the, the only band I could think of, we were more sort of geographically uh, dispersed, and maybe Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, you know, because you're living in, in Brazil now. And, yeah. How, yeah. Australia is a much longer flight. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. But um, obviously, you have to work in isolation, and we all know these days it's possible to do that. But... What are the sort of challenges of, of doing that? Well, the thing is, we lived in different places for most of the time anyway. When we first started, there was three of us living in Liverpool when we formed. Mira always lived in London. Um, one by one, I think Helen was first, then Ruby moved to London, and there was three, three of us in London at one point. Um, I moved to Italy. Um, so I was in Italy for like the third and fourth album. I was in Paris for a bit as well. Um, so we always, we were used to doing this, like writing and then getting together um, um, to, to finish the record. So what, it's not actually that different to living in, you know, in Manchester or in Liverpool or, or Glasgow to uh, living in a different country. It's just longer flights and um, more expensive. More expensive. <laughs> but um, what happened, the pandemic, obviously, what seemed so simple and, 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 uh, and easy before, the pandemic made it incredibly difficult. Um, so that was the that was the big difference. It made us, you know, it made us realize again the kind of the fragility of all this, all this stuff that we take to be permanent. Which then is I another suppose, theme of the album as well. Yeah. I suppose the, the pandemic forced everybody to learn how to work that way. So you yeah. know, you're just a bit ahead of the curve. Yeah, exactly. We were just yeah, yeah the vanguard. <laughs> um, going back to you know, the Lady Tron history, now we're talking about six oh four. I, I, I do think people didn't know quite what to make of you in those days because um, there, it was it was kind of playful, there was a sort of humour to it and it was referential to, you know, there's, there was a track on there that basically sounded like the Are You Being Served theme and stuff like that. And people thought, well, is this just a joke? Are they just being kind of kitsch? They didn't sort of, they weren't sure how to take it. Is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say. Um... <laughs> And also, we've got to think about the time that we were in in Liverpool. Like, so it was all just like hairy boys with guitars. And so we were very, very different. And obviously, the two female leads was pretty unique then as well. And obviously, there's been female leads before. But um, yeah, so that, that was a bit different. And the Bulgarian, we had that going for us. Also, also <laughs> the keyboards. It's like, do you remember there was a point when even having a keyboard one keyboard in a, in, a, in a regular guitar band, you know, guitar, bass, drums. Even having a keyboard was kind of exotic in the 90s. So did you swoop in there when keyboards were really cheap and you could just buy them all? Yeah, out? it wasn't like, oh, we're going we're gonna to track down this synth we really want that's completely fetishized. No, we bought them from car boot sales, yeah. and, you know, charity shops and stuff like that for 20 quid. And, uh, and then we turned up, so 
it was you know it was exotic to have one keyboard in the band. We just showed up with four keyboards and nothing else. <laughs> This is something I, I noticed, I, I actually reread an old live review I wrote with you, um, that your keyboard had Cleopatra written on it. And then I looked into it and found out that you all had these different names, like yours was Ulysses and so on, because otherwise they were identical keyboards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Corb gave us them. Yeah. Corb gave us, they were going, oh, this band is kind of like a, synth, a new synth pop band and they have a new keyboard out. And so they actually gave us them as a, as a form of promotion. Oh, nice. um, so they were impossible to sound check because they were identical. Yeah. So that's why we gave them those names. Yeah. And then people went, oh, what's this mean? You know, and then it became something on our Wikipedia, which yeah. we've just <laughs> actually re re <laughs> yeah. dug up. Yeah. Well, yeah, at, at least I can say I wrote the review myself in the first place. So right, okay. Wikipedia you got it for me. So you were the original. All right, you were the citation. All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so between 604 and Light and Magic, it seemed that there was a sort of great leap forward. Uh, I, you know, I love 604, but there, there was this real leap in terms of what, what you felt you, you could do and what you could achieve musically, because it's a much more grandiose and sort of magnificent feeling of effort. Yeah, it was just, we, we, well, we knew what we were doing. The first album, we were, it was, it was coupled together, really. It, it was little batches of material um, that, we, that we put together into an album. Because um, when I joined, there'd been a previous singer. Yeah, think, yeah. So the fir very first yeah. single had a different singer on it, which so that single kind of belonged to a, like a different, almost like a different project. Yeah, um, and that was on there, and we'd had an EP out, which which was basically half the album uh, in Japan, um, <clears throat> and and yeah. So then by the time we did the second album, we'd had we'd had some success with the first one. We we knew what we were doing. There was a there was a plan there. We had management. We did that on the first album. We had a label in place in the uh, in the United States, uh, Emperor Norton Records, and uh, Steve Frost, who signed us to them in two thousand, is now our manager and he's present here. And without him, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, so yeah, we knew what we were doing, and they had a plan. They had a plan for us to um, to record out in LA because they were based there, and it was more. It was kind of a way of looking after us in a way. You know, we'd be we'd be supervised. You know, if we needed anything, the label office was just down the street, and everything else. Uh, so we worked with Mickey Petralia, who'd um, done done Back Midnight Vultures just before. Worked with Beastie Boys, various other people. So yeah, it was, a, it was a bigger, more ambitious record, but most of it was just us knowing what we were doing yeah. a bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more, <laughs> not completely. And then just when everybody thinks they've got you pinned down as this synthesizer group, the next album you start getting into noise and guitars and stuff. Yeah. I think really that was us just, I think for me that was me getting into it. That was a point kind of growing in confidence a little bit, you know, gradually. Light and Magic, I think you wrote most of it, um, and but we toured a lot more by the by the third album, so um, that made a huge difference to our sound and how we wanted to present ourselves and, and how we were on stage. So it was quite a leap, really, and um, yeah, I see that as a kind of changing like point for Lady Tron. Really. It sounds like a leap on the record though, but to, at the time to us, it, it felt evolutionary because Light and Magic, when we went out to tour it, um, the first album, we did a bit of touring. We went around Europe, we did some shows down here, but the show was really, really simplistic. Uh, we didn't have a drummer or anything like that. And we didn't go to the United States on that, on that tour, even though the album had done well, because, uh, because Steve didn't think we were ready. Um, with the second album, we got like an expanded lineup. We had a drummer and a bass player, and in this process of being on tour for a year with this, we got it got harder and harder and harder. So if you actually saw us in two thousand and two compared to a year later, um, a lot of the set was, it was just way harder. It was a different beast altogether, and that was what went into the studio to make Witch an Hour. So for us, it just felt this gradual process. But if you'd only if you hadn't seen us live and you only sort of listened to the second record and listened to the third one. It seemed like more of a jump than it actually was. Yeah, I, I found an old interview I did with you around that time, and you were saying that a lot of the noises on that record that people thought were guitar were, were guitars were actually synthesizers and vice versa. Yeah, we were mastering. Um, we were mastering some. I can't remember what track. And like the guy was like, "I'm just gonna, uh, you know, boost this uh, mid range to 
bring out the guitars and it's like there's no guitars on it. It's like, you what? Are you serious? Yeah, there's no guitars on it at all, not one. But um, the, there were quite a few remixes that came out for me around that time that um, had loads of guitar on them. So there was uh, Blue Jeans, the uh, Eddie Temple Morris mix of that, which is basically I Want to Be Your Dog, matched again with that. There's the Soul Wax mix of 17, which, which I, I don't know if I'm right about this, but it sounded like Away by the Borshoi, or Goth Band, the riff on that. I don't know where Soul Wax got it from. I don't want stuff that happened to me. Oh, really? Yeah. And we just basically, I, we were in the studio recording 17. We had a rough mix of it. We had the acapella. And, and I just, I was messaging with, uh, with David from Soul Wax. It's, can you just do us a rock version of this? He was like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> About two days later, it just there showed it was. us. I think it was, it was ready before the actual mix of the song. And on your um, softcore jukebox or mixtape compilation, there was that cover version of Oops Oh My, R&B hit by Tweet, which is basically very guitar-y, very sort of punky version of that. No guitar, though. <laughs> just to be clear yeah right <laughs> if you say so yeah so um, the, the albums uh, sort of later on seem to get more kind of um, maybe abstract musically and maybe i'm wrong about this because you said that you know, to you the new album is just it's a lady tron record but um less about like you know writing a massive pop hit and more about the feel of the record um as you know Velocifer, am I saying that right? Velocifer, or how do you spell it? I say it. say how, how, how I want to say it. I say it. Uh, do you? I think um, it's in Italian. Velocifer. I think it's actually Velocifer. Oh, it's okay. So it's Italian and Gravity the Seducer and self titled album. So, yeah. So, do, do you see a sort of steady progression to the new album, or do you not really think in those terms? I don't know. I think, I think there, was, there was a trajectory between those first five albums. And then we took this big break. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the last album, the self-titled one, it felt to me like we were just hitting reset and we just let's make a later on record. We weren't really thinking about what we've done previously. Mm. Um, and even the, and the same for the new one. Um, Maybe so. This one, it did feel like we wanted to break. It was like um, it was for so you know obviously whenever anyone um, pigeonholed us, um, there was so much more going into the band at the beginning and all along so many different influences there was so much in the dish that we sprung from um and then we'd make this record and someone would go oh they're, they're, they're like the human league look you know there's 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 two two young women in the band and they've had some synths or whatever and it wasn't really where we were coming from um so i think with each record um it was a motivation to 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 show what we could do um but by the time by the time we've done five albums, it was like, all right, this is what we are. We found what we are. Mm. We we make these records; they're different, but they they sound like us. Yeah, you mentioned um, uh, Emperor Norton. Um, obviously, you're now with Cooking Vinyl. I think the Cooking Vinyl guys are here tonight. Yeah, here. Hello. Um, but in terms of label history, you have had a lot of luck, have you? I mean, I, I'm trying to think of, of bands who've been through more labels, maybe Sparks, but um, yeah, I mean, in a fraction of the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've got a list here, um, like Invicta Hi-Fi, which is your label, wasn't it, originally? Um, Emperor Norton. Um, there was Telstar, um, oh, Island as well. And Telstar was a weird situation. Well, Telstar was a weird situation, but it was one that we, we you know, opted into. Yeah. Because um, Telstar was like a pure pop label. And... Um, I was really into the idea of being on them because that band Mystique. Yeah. So it was like we'd be label mates with Mystique, and it'll be amazing. Imagine, like we'll we'll get invited to their parties and stuff. It'll be amazing. Did you even meet them? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not once. He sold it to me as well. Yes. <laughs> and old, you know, and so and so once we were on there, like okay, and then they they did the only thing that they knew how to do, which was market us as a pure pop band looking and sounding like we did in these black uniforms and <laughs> everything they just, oh, they just put us through the machine as, yeah. as, as, a, as a pop group and um, so it was interesting but then well, yeah we were doing the new record with them we were doing which out with them but they, they they went bankrupt but and an island picked you up yeah well we were still with emperor norton so the fact that we were in, with emperor norton in the united states about well, north america that kept us going because we always had that independence regardless of what latest snafu happened in the in the uk yeah. so ireland was just a write-off it was the guy signed us he was like head of a and r he said you know where you are with me i'm head of a and r i'm not going anywhere <laughs> right? i'm gonna be your champion right i'm here you can rely on me 
and I was away on a holiday and I got a message from Jim Abbas, the producer, and he's like, have you heard that he's left the label? So it was, <laughs> it was before we'd even released the record on Ireland. So the whole thing was just a disaster. We were basically orphaned there. Yeah. But we were still on Emperor Norton. Mm-hmm. And, but also something happened. Um, we realized we didn't really need, at that point we realized we had this like international audience. We toured that album for two years. So what was happening in the UK didn't really correspond to what was happening outside. And um, we realized we had a bit of independence there. So. Um, it was a shame for that record at the time because I think it's a it's a great record. Um, it was wasted in the UK. And after Ireland, you were with Network actually for a little while. That that was fairly stable for a bit. Yeah. But then um, you got caught up in uh, the whole pledge mu- pledge music debacle. And that oh yeah, fuck that. Was that. Yeah. But um, <laughs> uh, but going back to Emperor Norton, wasn't it? A, 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 you I... can't say that because people gave us money. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> if, 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 we, if we if we tell you what happened, it'll just be it'll just be yeah, right. We basically yeah. spent all our own money trying to bail that out. So. Yeah. But I heard you on the uh, Martin Ware podcast, Electronically Yours, recently, and you told this amazing story about Emperor Norton that essentially um, your deal with them fell through because you were too popular. Am I getting this right? <laughs> Steve, Steve can attest to this, but basically um, it, was, it was funded by the, the Getty Foundation, and um, because Steve was doing a good job and signing good bands like, like us, um, they started turning a profit, but it wasn't supposed to turn a profit. It was supposed to lose money. <laughs> uh, so they, they decided that they were going to sell the label. So, um, so Ryko Disc bought it, and then that kind of went up in smoke. So. But Emperor Norton was a, a fabulous label to be on because it was a label that was more or less designed to lose a million dollars a year. That's right, Steve, right? You'll attest to this. Um, so it was a good place to be for a while. In the spirit of the actual Emperor Norton, if you don't know who that is, look up on Wikipedia, it's an amazing story. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so you you were on hiatus for, well, seven years, 2011 to 2018. Um, Helen, I, I saw an interview with you um, where, where you said, we talked about the sort of early days when, when you first realised that the band was going to be a sort of going concern, and you said, um, I'd say the turning point was when we all left our proper jobs. Well, I, I know you were all involved in music during the hiatus, but were there at times you, know, you, you went back to, to or, or you thought about going back to proper jobs, as it were? No. <laughs> Everyone had different things going on. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, like Mira, you know, she does, she makes documentaries, she's very successful with yeah. this, uh, but it's, uh, it doesn't feel like proper job stuff. Um, it just feels like we've all got different interests and different um, creative attributes, yeah. and and we used them, especially having, you know, seven years off. It wasn't really seven years, though, to be honest. It was about probably only about four. We were still writing like yeah. a lot of that time. But well, you did two solo albums. Well, your two albums, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did that, but yeah. later for Lady Trump as well. It just took a bit longer to get there, I think. And we were waiting for your second album to come. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> When you were making those two solo albums, in your mind, were they aside from Lady Tron or were they post Lady Tron? Did you think, well, that's it now? Sometimes, so um, so yeah, it was it was never like that. So um, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Like, I don't want to get a real job, and um, because it's been so long, no one's going to have me. You know, no one is going to take me unless I go back to school and study. No one's going to have me. So. Um, yeah, so, and also, you know, I'm writing, I'm writing music, so why not the ultimate goal of that is to put it out? You know, you want people to hear what you're doing. So, um, it was actually Danny that took me into it, because I was a bit like, oh, 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 oh Goose, you're so, no, I can't be a solo album, don't be silly. And he was like, just do it. No, we've I, got I, the time, I, we've I got the said, time. Yeah, you've yeah. got this opportunity to do it, you might as well just go for it now, you know, because we knew, knew we weren't going to make a later on record for ages. Mm. And I was worried about money, I was like, oh, I, haven't got, I haven't got any money for this, and and then it, I think it was just at the start of Pledge and all these kind of um, oh, crowd, yeah, crowdfunding things. That, yeah, yeah, so, so it worked so out okay for you. Mine now. was a, yeah. a really great success. Yeah. <laughs> it would have worked okay for us if we'd done it a year earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so, um, so I did that, and yeah, like basically all the later Tron fans got behind me, and I was really thankful for that. And yeah, so it was a really great opportunity for me. And um, Danny um, produced it. 
um, with the first one, one. Yeah, the yeah. first one with um, Margie Johansson and Iceland. So we, I had got all the songs together really beforehand, um, and Danny did production on on most of them, and then we we went out to Iceland for a month. Yes, because I just I've been working with Bardi. Um, I've done a done a movie score with him. Yeah. Uh, this film, Would You Rather? Um, it's um, a horror film. Yeah, and I don't, I don't like horror films very much. <laughs> it, it's excruciating to watch. I have to watch them a hundred times. Um, Do you have to figure out, you know, right, this has to sound really scary at this exact moment. So, of, yeah, so there's yeah. no way around watching them. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, uh, yeah, so, but it was, it turned out well. I think that the, the, the score we did, um, it's a good, it's a good feel. It's a satisfying feeling if you do a score and it really, if it enhances the film, it made it, made it a lot more ornate. Um, and yeah, so I've done a few things with Bardi uh, uh, since. Um, and you did a lot of production work and remix stuff in, in the meantime. And were you in a band as well in Brazil? Uh, I had like a kind of, I had a few projects there, not like anything, um, kind of like one offs, but I did some production, um, writing production for a singer called Leah Paris. That's the, the person I've worked with most. And um, yeah, she's, you should check her out. She's really good, interesting character. I want to, when, when we were sorting out the album, like with the, the EP we're doing together, um, I arranged to meet her in this cafe in the afternoon just to um, just to talk through like really mundane logistics of how we were going to do it and she just showed up painted silver <laughs> and just didn't say anything about it we just sat there totally normal yeah um, so yeah and um, I also I joined uh, I joined pink industry as well uh, for people who don't know you should uh, explain well, okay, so I don't know whether you're familiar with Rock Family Trees, um, but the Liverpool one, Liverpool post-punk one, you have Big in Japan as the band at the top of the tree, and almost every single band that you know from Liverpool since is somehow related to that. So the singer of Big in Japan is Jane Casey, is a friend of mine, so she went on when Big in Japan broke up, she made Pink Military and then Pink Industry. Frankie Goes to Hollywood came from there, yeah. Tear Up Explodes came from there, The Bunny Man came from there. Um, so that band Pink Industry broke up in 1987. Um, they didn't, uh, they didn't even know where the guitarist was, they hadn't seen him in 25 years. And uh, so I joined on guitar, so I'm kind of an associate member of, uh, of, of Pink Industry. Um, so that was one, yeah, that was, that was just a one-off show, actually, in Brazil, actually, because uh, they're disproportionately big there. Um, Helen, in 2015, um, you released a standalone single, Wolves, um, which was inspired by the um, independence referendum uh, and that campaign in Scotland, and you were very much kind of encouraging people not to be scared to take the leap. There's the line, fear of change, oh, come on. Do you think fear of change is what did for it in the end? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to talk about because it's so divisive, really. You know, I'm sat here in London and I feel a lot of people that disagree with me, but you know, it's like we're all allowed our own opinions, aren't we? So, um, but yeah, I mean, it was just like being in Glasgow at that time, it was just it was so fiery, it was so like so so divided, like opinions, and um, yeah, you know, your emotions are running high. and. I just felt like, you know, I'm going to express it somehow. So I just threw this single out um, really super quickly. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, it does comment on the situation at the time. Um, and yeah, ultimately, I do think that, that, that a lot of people in Scotland think that they're unable to go it alone. Mm -hmm. but I think that it is drummed into us as well quite often that we need like a big brother or someone to show us what to do. I mean, I think Scotland's been leading the way for quite a long time, really, in a lot of different areas. Um, so, um, yeah, to be told that you're not quite good enough or smart enough or big enough, um, I find a little bit hard to take. So, yeah. yeah, coming from a Welsh perspective, you know, I think a lot of people in that movement in Wales are waiting for Scotland to go first. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, I wanted Scotland to go and take Liverpool with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Liverpool's not really part of England anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Um, uh, Danny, I've, I've heard, while we're on politics, um, I've, I've heard you, uh, again on the Martin Weir podcast, talking quite a lot about the situation in Brazil, and on social media you talk about it quite a lot as well. What, what do you think, um, for people outside of Brazil, the, the biggest misconception people have about the situation in Brazil? Well, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of misconceptions about Brazil in general. Um, what we actually see outside um, is extremely narrow. Um, you tend to get, uh, there's an impression that you have Copacabana Beach, Favela, and then the rainforest, and there's nothing else. <laughs> and, you know, Christ the Redeemer sitting on top. And, you know, it's not like we're supposed to know everything about every other country, but this is a country of 220 million people. It's a, it's a continent-sized place that... Um, it, it seems strange to me when I moved there how little we knew about it. And um, what's happened um, What's happened since? I mean, everyone knows that you know, Bolsonaro is gone, you know, thank God. Um, and it's an incredible relief um, for, you know, for the majority of the population. Um, and I think that I, there's a certain misconception about him, I think, because just from my friends, I spoke to someone and they had the impression that he wasn't, oh, he's not that right wing, is he? And I was like, but literally a Nazi, you know? It's like, I don't know. They said, oh, he's not as bad as Trump, is he? And everyone obviously makes a, makes a comparison. So maybe he's, he's worse. And I think him and, him and Boris Johnson and Trump are actually three manifestations of the same Thing. They're actually very, very similar. The presentation is different, but ideologically very similar. And and he's in Orlando now, living in the the house of a of a UFC fighter. Um, and he can't, he won't come back anytime soon because he'll just get arrested. So the good riddance. Um. So I remember uh, around the t- I guess it would have been around the time of Witching Hour. Um, when I interviewed you for the Independent on Sunday, and that, that was on, on the front cover. And I think the headline on the front cover, I had nothing to do with this, by the way, but it was something about, you know, Lady Trump, the next big thing, yeah. you know. I got that on my wall. <laughs> and I think, um, what happened, Simon? <laughs> I know, and Dorian Linsky in The Guardian also said, you know, that the future may be theirs. And I, I, I actually, I, I really didn't want the Independent to, to go with that angle, because I thought, well, that's not what they're trying to do here. They're not, they're not the next big thing. They're, they're a bit more under the radar than that. And I, I just wondered if, if you're actually really quite happy with the level of success that you're at, that you've got an audience you know is out there. You, you know you can, if you tour, people will come. If you put a record out, people will buy it. But, you know, you're not expected to, to be any kind of next big thing. <laughs> Without the mad levels of intrusion that that comes with, yeah. So it's like I don't know. I know, but I'm kind of happy with this. I mean, we we sold out Coco last night. It, it, it feels good. I don't think I don't know whether we were ever we were supposed to be any bigger than this because when we started, you know what it was like. We were a little indie band. It wasn't like there was commercial synth pop out there. You're talking about pre Lady Gaga, which probably changed everything. She was obviously very influenced by Electro Clash and the kind of things we were involved with years before. But it's very, very different now. And um, I'm like, you know, I think yeah, to play the kind of size, size shows we do, especially in the United States and other places around the world, um, I've, I've never thought, oh, I want to start <coughs> bigger than this, to be honest. Yeah, I do. I, no, you do. You want to play Wembley. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, my one thing way, way back was what, that I wanted to be on top of the pops, and then that was just ruined. So uh, uh, yeah, they, 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 yeah, they cancelled it, didn't yeah, they? So well, you lined up to be on it at any point. No. Because no, no, our singles all got, got to number 41. <laughs> Every, oh, almost every single, every single one. It became a running joke. It was yeah. like forty-three. Yeah, they'd, they'd, they'd 41. always be midweek in like the top thirty, and then be forty-one or forty-three or forty-two, yeah. always. But there's no way that any of us could have handled like fame or no. um, the intrusion that comes with it. No way, because we're so private and and quite shy. So. Um, yeah, it wouldn't have worked. Even this we're is probably, weird, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more than this. <laughs> we probably would have split up, for sure. Yeah. You mentioned Electro Clash, and we also mentioned earlier on the fact that when you started out, really nobody was playing synth music. Um, and there have been fluctuations, haven't there, in, in how kind of maybe fashionable, how popular electronic music has been. 
you've just sort of been there all along. You, you must have been sort of watching these rises and falls just with a sort of arched eyebrow. Oh, here it goes again. You know, suddenly it's cool again. And, you know. I, I don't know about that. I, I mean, it's just been interesting to see the evolution of it. I, I, well, I see it as, as a linear evolution. There's like, as you say, there's peaks, peaks and troughs of popularity. Um, but I don't, I don't see it as, I don't see it in terms of waves. Um, I mean, look at like what Kylie did and stuff like that as yeah. well, like Slow and all those kind of records. It was, yeah, she was doing yeah. it back then. Well, there's definitely a time, wasn't there, um, in the 2000s where, um, well, Electro Clash had happened and it was kind of, uh, I don't know, a London, Berlin, New York kind of hipster thing originally. But it did definitely influence mainstream pop. So you had Kylie, you had Lady Gaga, people like that. Um, Madonna? Yeah, yeah. So I, I suppose some of these people must have courted you to work with, and you ended up working with Christina Aguilera. How, how did that come about? Well, uh, we just, got, yeah, we were on tour and we just got this email. Christina wants to work with you um, and to go, to go and meet her in LA. And uh, we went to LA. The boys went. Yeah, we went. And, <laughs> yeah. And, but uh, like, funny enough, Mir and I didn't get asked. That's <laughs> all. It's, it's not Sorry. Um, but it was funny because um, we were supposed to meet her, and then it was like it kept being cancelled. And so every every day it was like, oh no, Christina can't meet you today. And she'd only recently had a child as well. It was a very you know difficult moment for her. She was, you know, to get involved professionally again. And uh, so every day it was like, oh, we're going to meet tomorrow. And then it, it didn't happen again. And then we got to the end of the week and we were ready to go back, go back to, to Britain. And we still hadn't met her. And it was like, we've literally come to L.A. for nothing. All expenses paid uh, for nothing. And then um, CSS, can't say they're so sexy, who'd, who'd opened for us in America where I knew them a bit from South Island anyway. <laughs> Uh, they were playing in town that night, and I was out for lunch with them, saying, "Yeah, we've we've been trying to you know meet up, but we've come over for this, and and uh, and she's cancelled every day so far." And while I was at lunch with them, I get this message um, saying, "Oh yeah, Christine's really sorry, but she wants to know whether you want to come to this show tonight." I can't say this is sexy. So um, so that was the first time we actually met. We got in this in her limo, and she had like this CD wallet. Full of really good rap that dates it exactly that really dates the story. Um, and it, but it had like she had our album, she had the, the first Elastica album, she had loads of this stuff. And um, and then um, and so we went to the show and we waited while Can't Say the Sir Sexy were on stage, we waited in their dressing room and we knew a couple of the band were really big fans of hers as well. Uh, and she sat there in the dressing room wearing Love Fox's wig. And they all came in after the show and just like, and just lost it. Like Adriano and Anna, they just had to leave the room. They just had to go, kind of lie down. Um, but I really respected what Christina did with that record because even though it didn't quite end up with what she originally intended, uh, the, the, the label insisted on some changes, brought in some different producers and, what, and make it more like her previous work or more in the, in the sphere of it as they saw. Um, but she approached the artists she really liked. She said, Lady Tron, do you want to work with me? Goldfrapp, do you want to work with me? Latigo, all these people, Santa Bowl. Rather than going to producer and saying, can you make something that sounds like this for me? Which is what most people do, to be fair. So I had a lot of respect for what she did. And um, I think the, ult the resulting album was great, but it was too weird for the label. Yeah. It's, it's so good to hear that, that that was coming from her. That was yeah. her musical taste. And she had your yeah. album. Because I suppose a lot of people would assume, oh, it's her, in a bit of commas, people have heard, oh, Lady Tron is a hip band, you, you need to work with them. But it actually, it was her. Completely her, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so circling back to um, the present day, um, since the sort of comeback, if you can call it a comeback, um, 2018, let's say, anyway, it, um, you had three singles that year, 2019, a single and an album, uh, 2020, a single, um, 2022, three singles, and now 2023, you've got the album. It's been pretty full on, you know, it's, it seems, seems like a very productive phase that, that you've been going through. Yeah, I mean, it's productive, but also I feel like I feel like we could have been more productive. It just feels like a lot of time is wasted. As Danny was saying earlier, you know, we were cut short. We did our last gig in Edinburgh on like the 10th of March or something, 2020, and we should have been continuing 
to really push that album for that entire year and um, you know like everyone else our lives changed so we never got around to that so it does feel like um yeah we lost time everyone lost time um but at the same time we were still writing um and with another album in sight you know but i mean the, we after those shows after that edinburgh show we went straight to to glasgow and started recording in um Mogwai studio, the Castle of Doom, which material for what would be Times Arrow. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had to abandon the sessions after about three days because we, it was whenever no one, no one really knew what was happening. It was getting worse by the hour. And uh, we went in for one day, then we got super paranoid and didn't go in, canceled the next day. And then we thought, you know what, when, we don't know when we're gonna be able to see each other again. So we went back in the studio again and uh, we got some work done. We, we worked on, I guess, um, the night. Um, we never went away. Um, City of Angels, uh, or what would become them. And then one day, the the the, the engineer Tony asked me, um, just because he's following the news. You see, we were we were working, so the, so he's really into it. And he said, when are you going back to, to Brazil, Danny? And I said, well, actually, I, 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 last week I changed my ticket because I wanted to be in Liverpool on Monday because we're about to win the league. We've got a game against that. And I want to be in town for this. I'm not going to miss this. And he was like, okay, that's interesting. Have you not thought about going out home any earlier, like perhaps tonight? Because <laughs> uh, he was watching the news and I wasn't. So I booked a new ticket. Um, there and then, there the, studio, and then yeah. the studio, the earliest one I could get because I couldn't get through to the airlines, I changed the one I had. And we, we abandoned the session and um, I told this story a couple of times, but Helen went, went and picked me up, he said, we'll go for one last drink. And uh, Helen picked me up outside and uh, I got in the car and like Dancing Queen by ABBA was on the radio. And I was just, it was just this eerie kind of silence, the two of us, and I was like, are you getting that? And then she's like, yeah. It's like we felt like we were in the first five minutes of the film. Yeah. You know, when no one knew how bad it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it was like, you know, this evening, you know, it was already dark. We went for a drink and watched people walking around, not really kind of oblivious. Mm -hmm. And so it left this kind of eerie, eerie shadow on the on the recordings we did there. But one thing that we, we, we said that we wanted to isolate the album from the pandemic and make sure it didn't influence it in any way because there was so much creation going on during the pandemic it was directly influenced by it and we were like no one is gonna want to know yes yeah, everyone's living this you don't want to listen to a song about it you don't want to watch a film about it um in the future it's going to be an interesting time capsule but we wanted to keep the album completely away from from any of it and and uh, we managed to do that. I've heard comedians say that, that the, you know, Edinburgh Festival that year was just going to be full of people doing their pandemic material. And it's just, yeah, nobody wants to hear that. It was so literal. The, like singles that came out during that time. Ah, oh, it drove me nuts. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned the song, uh, City of Angels, and there, there are some amazing lyrics on, on this album. And um, you know, when you go on, uh, well, my, my sort of, Lyrics website of choice is usually genius.com, but there are other ones. And they're always wrong. I, this is what's right, I'm right. This is exactly what I want to know. Okay. It's exactly what I'm going to ask you because this to me seemed like really amazing writing. I'm going to read it, but you're going to tell me it's wrong anyway. Okay. So, halogen sunsets over asphalt museum, right. fragmenting language like jazz to young ears. Yeah. Correct. That's correct. Well, that's, that is, well, well done. That's amazing writing. <laughs> but, it, but it should be correct because we put the lyrics in the album. So oh, it's well, there in the notes. Was that, was, that, was that you? Was that? Uh, no, that's not. No, the, I mean the song. Uh, that was the one mine. That's one of yours, yeah. But, that, but what, what we say is like the, the, the records are, um, you know, they contain the lyrics. The lyrics are on Spotify as well. There's no excuse for this lyric genius, whoever they are, yeah, yeah, yeah. to keep <laughs> to keep printing. Not so clever now, are they? Yeah, I don't know who who, who defined him as a genius, but uh, yeah, we have to yeah clean it up. And there were a few things that I thought kind of maybe reference back to the very early days. So there's the line "Dreaming our way out of this town," and I maybe think of Playgirl, you know, sleep your way out of your hometown. Was that a deliberate thing, a little throwback there, a little callback? No, no, it wasn't. It yeah. wasn't. It was just uh, me um, in a, a daze, writing at home, looking out over my sunny garden in the summer. And um, yeah, we were locked, locked in, and I often just kind of go into my own head and 
and a song people ask me what a song is about and like, I can't always tell them because it's it's like I take my phone from my place, mm-hmm. which isn't real. Yeah. And there were again a certain amount of playfulness like like on the first album. So uh, the song California, there's um, a line about clouds in, in my coffee, and it's the old uh, you're so vain Carly Simon reference there. Yeah. Just just <laughs> little, little Easter eggs put in there for people, I suppose. Um, well, the album to give people something. Yeah. yeah, the album's had a really good reception. You must be really pleased about that. Um, I, I know uh, you're going to be signing copies uh, right at the back, or I guess it's the front of the shop. Um, so in a minute, uh, if everyone sort of lines up along I think the left hand side, they wanted to do. Um, but um, yeah, just before we do that, anything else that you want to you say? Anything I've missed? No, you just wait. you cannot wait to get home. Okay. Thank you to everyone. Yeah, and we'll say thank you and yeah. thanks to everyone for, uh, for buying coming. the album and coming. Yeah. So, um, thank you, um, Cleopatra and Ulysses. I mean, uh, Helen and Danny, Lady Tron.